Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Canada Today Show uh, on Muslim Network TV. Today we have a special artistry segment uh, where we highlight a change maker, a young change maker uh, who happens to be from Montreal, Canada. Um, this episode typically, or this series, uh, epi- uh, series of change makers uh, typically highlights people. Um, all kinds of people who have done some great things, uh, who have achieved something, who have special talents, and have done something good um, and significant in their lives, and more, spe- more specifically for those people around them. Um, I'm your host, Taha Ghayur, and today we will be exploring the world of visual art, uh, visual arts, and photography specifically including how this creative medium can be leveraged to tell stories and pass on life-challenging experience, life-changing experiences. Um, when the tragic explosion of Beirut happened uh, that, that shattered lives of thousands of Lebanese people, this Montreal phot- photographer put everything aside to travel on his own dime to Beirut just days after the August tragedy and disaster. I'm excited to speak with a rising photographer, Oliver Druin, who goes by the name of Drowster. Um, Drowster is a documentary producer, a travel photographer. He is a passion, uh, he has a passion for capturing the plight of isolated communities through visual arts and storytelling. Drowster often describes himself and his work as a dedication to eradicating prejudice through the power of beauty. His photography work has sent him across the world uh, to create compelling visual storytelling for brands in North America and Europe. Drowser's images from his travel to Asia and the Middle East have earned him the title Montreal's new photographic sensation. Today, uh, I'll speak with Drowster about his success journey, his future plans, and and the inspiring global themes that motivate him to keep snapping his camera. Welcome, uh, Drowster, to Canada Today show today. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Thank you. Well, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, I'm sure you know this more than anybody else, and you have you know, proven it, of course, through your own uh, work of photography and visual storytelling. Um, I wonder, you know, how you came to realize this talent, how you came to develop this talent of photography to begin with? I'd say I'm really a kid of my generation. So I started, I I was actually completing a college degree in cinema. And uh, I, my parents moved out of Montreal in a rural area and every day I would go back I just found that the light was incredible I was taking pictures of the sunsets uh, while driving I was always facing the sun so it was really really beautiful and living out of the city in the nature I, I really was amazed by how everything was so beautiful and so I started taking pictures with my phone of the beautiful light I was um, seeing every day uh, either like on the on uh, on a coffee in my mother's house or outside in the forest or wherever. And over time, I just took more and more and more and more pictures since the, the camera was in my pocket. Mm. And with time, I developed a style and I developed um, a, a technique that, that is mine. And um, that's kind of how it started. And over the years, I got a camera and got into portraits eventually, but it, it really started with pictures from my phone. Nice. I mean, you know, most people out there uh, just play with their phones and most of the time they are just snapping useless photos um, about themselves, about what they're up to. And it's more about, you know, about themselves. But you actually chose to fo- do photography or snap photos um, and, and capture images of the wonders of the world around you, um, which makes it, I think, uh, of course, a lot more meaningful. Um, and speaking of style, you mentioned something. You do have a, a unique style that is that seems to uh, be focused more on, you know, specific techniques rather than uh, rather than sort of your yourself or the person behind the camera. So t- 
tell us a little bit about your style of photography. Uh, what makes it unique and um, how does it stand out basically from the clutter of photographies that are out there? I'd say two things. First off, uh, I only use natural light. I just find the light that is natural in this world, like from the sun, so beautiful. So I refuse to use a flash. I've never used a flash and I don't think I will ever. Um, so I always, since you're always working with the same light, I mean, not the same light, it's always changing, but since you're always uh, working with natural light, you develop, I mean, a style around that light and you understand it better, how to use natural light outside, inside, at night, during the day. So, so I'd say natural light is really part of my style. And I feel that people really feel it when it's natural and people feel it when it's, it's fake and when a, a flash is used. So I'd say using natural light is the first one. And secondly, um, it's something that took me a lot of time to figure out, but I'm an extremely shy person. Um, I mean, before I was even more. And so I never really, I was too shy to take pictures of people on the street without asking them, without interacting with them, without hearing their stories. So with time, I realized that this problem that I had of being too shy and um, not having the guts of just taking a picture of someone on the street passing by, finding that disrespectful, um, it, it really forced me to, to take more of my time to really get to know the person, gain their trust, uh, tell them why I'm taking their picture, hear their stories. And I, I feel that people really feel my, people often say, it's weird, we feel like we're there in your pictures if it's a portrait. So I think being shy really forced me to, to work in the intimacy of people by giving myself time, giving the, the situation time. I think those two aspects, natural light and um, time and just, yeah, not rushing things, being there for the Amazing. people, I think it really feels. That's awesome. So working with nature and natural light, of course, and, and working with people, communicating and connecting with people. So that's amazing. I mean, you know, that's what makes your photography definitely so uh, personable and definitely so more uh, genuine. And, and that's great to hear from you. Um, so you did mention that you, you know, you meant, you mentioned, um, you went to, you studied uh, cinema, uh, but did you actually ever study photography per se uh, and these specific techniques? I mean, are you a self-taught person, uh, or, or did you actually take specific training in photography yourself? During uh, my college degree for cinema, we actually had one class that was the history of photography, which really showed me uh, the beginning of photography, how it started, the evolution of the technique, um, as well as famous photographers and famous pictures that really had an impact on the world. But other than that, I never followed a photography course. I did follow a photojournalism photo course in university. Uh, it was really like how to approach people and how to frame your subjects and everything. But um, other than that, it's all self-taught. I've been following a lot of classes online. Now there are so many with the pandemic. So I'm really purchasing uh, classes online and trying to learn, but it's all by myself. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, that's definitely an accomplishment. Um, and uh, welcome back to Canada. I mean, I know you were, you were in uh, Beirut for a few days. The last month, uh, you went there to capture the aftermath of the Beirut explosion. Um, and to those our viewers who are not aware, I hope you're all aware, um, just a bit of a recap, there was an explosion, a factory explosion that devastated uh, you know, the entire city basically, but more specifically 200 people plus were killed um, and thousands were injured in this tragic uh, man-made uh, accident, unfortunately. Um, and in an interview, uh, you know, Drowster uh, with City News, you described your mission was to fight uh, Islamophobia by showing people uh, the footage of the explosion. So why was this important for you uh, to, you know, pack up everything all of a sudden and, um, and, you know, just days after to travel to Beirut to capture images? What, what is that story you're trying to tell? I mean, being a young, 27 year old, you know, uh, individual, you have so many things, other things you could do in life, uh, than to actually go to disaster zone and capture photos. Uh, why was it so personally important to you 
to tell the, this particular story? And why is this connected to Islamophobia? I'd say uh, going to Beirut, uh, it was my third time, is part of a broader story about uh, the Middle East and fighting Islamophobia. So basically, to keep it short, I discovered through books, I'd say in 2015, that the Middle East and its people were really victims of um, of a false image. People only, when they think of Middle East, they only see images either in movies of bombs or in the news. So I told myself, well, why don't go over there and tell the stories of the people? Because we do not hear the stories of the people. They do not have a voice. They do not have a medium of communication. So I'm like, I'm privileged. I have money to travel. I come from a good country where our uh, currency is strong. Um, and so why not go over there and tell them their stories? So in 2016, I left and I spent 10 months uh, crossing the Middle East. I did half of the countries in the Middle East. And um, with all the projects that I was doing, uh, when I came back, I realized that a lot of them are about just making people fall in love with the region, making people listen to the stories of the people. Uh, I find that you have to create the connection between Westerners and Middle Easterners. You have to show them that their stories, you have to show that they're human. Just provide content, me it's pictures, uh, that go away from the terrorist uh, spe I mean, coverage. So I'm doing this kind of fight against Islamophobia, Islamophobia sorry, uh, through different projects. Some are really like landscape oriented. Uh, mm -hmm. Some are more just showing that there are so many awesome stories in the Middle East and so many awesome people. So I went back to Lebanon in November when the revolution started because I saw pictures online how the revolution was so different from everything we had in mind of what was a revolution in the Middle East. So there was a lot of like hugs between soldiers and kids. There was like flowers being given to people. There was like dancing in the streets. I'm like, this actually proves that Middle East is not only bombs and explosion, that there's a lot of love, there's great people that just want a better country. So I went there in November and um, I, I had the time of my life just being there and living a historical moment. And so I told myself I would do a bigger project of really documenting this whole crisis that Lebanon is going through. So like the pandemic, the revolution, now the explosion, economical collapse, everything. So it's part of this bigger project of documenting Lebanon. And I find that by sharing the stories of the individuals, it really, um, instead of just talking about the, the, the explosion in Beirut and just talking about like the event, if you go there and you talk to people and you share their stories and how they suffered and how they're sad and how they're mad, it, it, it creates compassion. And I think that uh, by creating compassion or encouraging it, uh, that's how people are going to love each other more. And that's my mission. Wow, oh, definitely a noble mission. Did you uh, see any, were there any moments that really stood out for you uh, emotionally when you went to uh, Lebanon recently? Uh, were there anything, was there anything that you felt really moved by? I'd say, of course, like seeing blood on the walls and that is still there and seeing uh, puddles of blood on the floor is, is intense, but I'd say uh, I know how fast the situation is changing in Lebanon, how many families are, are falling into poverty, how they're losing all their life savings, how the currency is losing its value. So I'd say one way of really seeing that is seeing people from you'd assume middle class that are well-dressed, nice jeans, nice shoes, like a 40, 45 year old man that you guess he's a father and and seeing a, a person that was well-dressed and it, trying to imagine his lifestyle, but then seeing him um, search for food in a dumpster is really like a clash of, of realities. And it, I find it really proves uh, the degrading situation in uh, Lebanon that is happening so fast and that is putting people that were so well-off before and were, were able to feed their families and everything now having trouble to, to do that. Wow. Were there any photos that you captured that you felt very satisfied about, uh, especially after 
um, after the, the bombing, uh, when you went there, was there one photo or a couple of snaps that you really felt that captured the emotion and the situation on the ground that you wanted to capture? I find there's one that is uh, indirectly related to the explosion, but the days following the explosion, there were a lot of protests uh, from the people as a frustration against the government. And um, during one of those protests, they started using live bullets and pellet guns. And I met this incredible girl called Yara, and she was at those protests. And right right when she was leaving the protest, uh, she got hit by a pellet gun. So... Mm -hmm she got a hundred pieces of metal in her body. I think she was hospitalized for three days. And I'm really happy of the pictures I did of her because it, it, it was a portrait, but it also, there was another picture that zoomed in on her uh, scars. And then there was another picture of her X-ray that you could see all the metal pellets in her body and showing, uh, showing a person that is of my age, that is a young adult that, that has a beautiful smile that is someone who's just living her life. She's doing artistic work or whatever. Um, and seeing how she's affected by the crisis and how she's just fighting to, to have a better country. But yet she, she now has, she's now stuck with a hundred pieces of metal in her body. Uh, that really, I find it, it's relatable to people back home, especially of my audience that are, are, are younger. And so of seeing someone that is similar to them, that could be them, that could be someone who's going out in clubs on Saturdays or going out at a bar or a restaurant and living her life. Now she's she's just victim of a system that she she tries to change, but it's hard. Hmm. Well, thanks for, <clears throat> thanks for your courage, first of all, uh, in doing all of this and, and for sharing all these things, some of which may not be very easy for you to recount even. Um, you have been to other countries in the world that, and you mentioned you know, the Middle East, you've been to Mexico, you've been to Laos, you've been to Iraq, you've, pro you've been part of several real life events out there uh, in other countries. Uh, was there any, you know, outside, outside of Lebanon, was there any other place that you've been to so far that was really memorable? And, and what was it, what, what, what made it so memorable uh, if there's one or more uh, in terms of not only your personal experience, but also the photography that you did in those places and telling stories? I'd say Iraq was really memorable because um, it was when ISIS was very active and still had control on Mosul. And um, being so, I was in Erbil, which is in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, and being so close from a war zone uh, is quite intense and hearing the choppers and everything going there. I think it's like 80 kilometers of uh, Erbil from Mosul. And um, so there was th this really dark aspect of war. And after passing a few checkpoints and seeing villages that were actually captured by ISIS and released, I mean, not released, uh, that they had lost control two weeks prior and, and seeing how dark it is and how soulless and how ruthless uh, it is. But at the same time, having an incredible hospitality from the people and um, being welcomed, like I couldn't even wish to be welcomed that much and just seeing how life continues and hearing the stories of people and really putting a face on a country that we heard too often negatively about and um so i'd say iraq was uh, very memorable wow um you have uh, done all this photography all these years for the past what good 10 years at least that you've been doing this if not more um i'm wondering uh, what about the impact, the impact that you're trying to have, uh, you know, as you say, you want to be able to, uh, you know, write history or rewrite history using images and photography, um, and you want to have a positive impact. What uh, in, kind of impact have you seen through the kind of storytelling you have been doing uh, through visual arts and visual, specifically photography here? Um, have you seen a positive response or maybe a response of shock or a response of, uh, you know, maybe even a negative response uh, with the kind of work when you display it uh, in local communities or in, you know, newspapers um, or news stories out there. What kind of responses have you gotten from 
those who have been reading or watching or you know seeing your photos basically i'm very lucky to have a platform on which i can share stories to a lot of people i've gained uh, a lot of followers over time on instagram and so i'm extremely uh, happy that when i share content that i find more important in the sense that it, it's you know like the buried explosion is horrible and compared to like sharing a, a nice picture of a forest i'm glad that people actually listen i'm glad that i, I get a lot of comments saying uh, people about people saying that they're, they're happy that i'm covering it when because the news cycle is so fast that it, it's easy like news outlets covered the Beirut explosion for a week max two and so if me being able to continue and continue to share those stories and yes there's like the big boom the visual intensity of the event but then there's all the consequences that are gonna continue for years and years and years mm -hmm. and so to document a part of those consequences and putting faces on those consequences by sharing stories I really feel like people are are happy to to hear more about it. I heard right when I started posting pictures about Beirut, uh, people saying they were giving donations after my pictures because they really saw uh, the faces of people that were affected and they heard their stories. So I'm I'm happy that people actually listen. And there there's so many things on social media that uh, are beautiful but are, are just beautiful but I, I'm happy to bring something that is, I hope, beautiful, but also meaningful. So of being able to match those two and just having people listen and caring about is 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 a privilege. Awesome. Beautiful and meaningful. That's the key here. Um, so what personally drives you and motivates you to keep doing all these amazing photography projects out there? Is there, are there, is there one or are there, you know, few motivations that, propel you to actually uh, keep doing things in very difficult parts of the world? I just love sharing stories and uh, I'm very, very inspired by Middle East and Asia as a continent, just the colors, the textures, the people, the hospitality, the stories, the history, the landscapes, the cities, the uh, all of that is so inspiring for me. That's why I don't do that many documentary projects back home because I find it very gray and it, it's too new for me to, to be excited about. So I'd say just a whole part of the world that is so awesome, that is so beautiful, and that don't necessarily have their own voice for them to share their own stories. I do hope that they, with, their, um, with, with time, they will be able to tell their stories. They're, but I just, I find there's so many stories to be told of resilience, of love, of hope, of optimism. So, it's really the, the, the stories of the people that really uh, inspire me to continue doing this and crossing the ocean. Awesome. You've done also quite, quite a bit of uh, like different types of photography. I mean, you know, there's so much out there, types of photography, like fashion, travel, food, all sorts of stuff. Um, you have done yourself photos and projects for, um, for newspapers, news stories, um, and uh, and of course for corporations, brands, charities. Um, I was wondering if is there a particular type of photography that you really like the most? I'd say documentary. Uh, documentary is really like photojournalism, but a bit more on on a longer. It takes more time. I mean, photojournalism is really about events, about news events, about oh that that car accident happened. I'm going to go take that picture, and that's it. But documentary stories are really more about the long term, about things that you don't see when you just go once. It, you really have to go back and back to, to really see progress or, or have a better uh, overview of the story. So I'd say documentary. Sadly, mm -hmm. it's harder and hard, harder to live off of documentary only with big magazines that actually shut down and people preferring like rapid news and ever changing news and the news cycle is so fast. So it, it's harder to do documentary photography, but it's really what drives me and I hope that um, I'm actually lucky that I can do documentary projects and then companies are like, wow, that's awesome. Can you do that with our brand? So I, mm -hmm. I hope that I could only live off of documentary, but uh, that's not feasible at the moment. So that's why I uh, take pictures of different genres, but documentary is really awesome because it's it's life, it's it's history that we're seeing in front of our eyes and it's the stories of real people. And definitely long term, like longer shelf life and definitely 
you know, a lot of historic value in future for something like that. I mean, you have been featured in The Guardian, Huffington Post, Vice, and other places. Um, and uh, you you take on all sorts of projects, but um, were there, was there a reason, and you did mention a little bit, talk a little bit about this, but was there a compelling reason why you decided to go for international photography rather than focusing on maybe something local, which probably most photographers out there do. I mean, you know, whether in Canada or Montreal itself or Quebec, uh, why you decided to, you know, explore the world and start taking photos and telling their stories. Um, was there a reason why you did not, you decided not to do it locally? I mean, you do a bit of the, some of that work, I understand, but your focus seems to be international photography. Indeed, I'd say I, I, before even doing photography, I was traveling in Asia a lot. And I just got to say, I fell in love with the region. Uh, as I said previously, it's really like the colors, the textures, the light, the, the, the landscapes, the history of the countries that like, even if they share the same border, like China and India, they're so different and they're separated by the highest mountain range in the world. So I find there are so many interesting things geographically. And the hospitality I get every time is absolutely mind blowing. So every time I go back, it's just like, there's so much life in the streets. I can talk to anyone. I'll be welcomed. I'll be welcome to grab tea with them, go in their houses. And it's a hospitality that um, really touches my heart and that I'm very lucky to be able to experience. And so I just really feel inspired by the region. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. It's amazing. So I'm sure doing uh, any type of ph travel photography comes with its own set of challenges. Um, what was the most, probably ch most challenging moment and probably scariest moment that you ever had to deal with uh, during your travels, especially traveling for photography work? I'd say it's, it, it can be really hard on the body. Um, I try to in this desire of doing documentary of really feeling what people feel. So if, so I did a, a series about um, women in agriculture in India. So I told myself I have to work with them in the field to understand their reality. And in mm -hmm. just two days, I got 11 blisters on my 10 fingers, wow. literally. And so really putting yourself in, in the situations of people you're, flog, you're taking pictures of, um, it, it's a thing that I actually love doing, even though it, it can be hard on the body. I'm often injured. Um, oh. Every time I come back in Montreal, I have to go see specialists to arrange my body. So I'd say, I mean, I don't mind having some pain on my body. It's it, it it's it's short lived, and it's not like if I was doing this all the time. But I'd say there are some challenges of. Uh, shooting in cold weather or in mountains and trying to get that, that good shot while you yourself surviving, uh, taking care of your safety and trying to share the, the story of the, of the person that gave you their trust. And so doing all that at the same time is really uh, a lot of energy. So literally you get into people's shoes and, and try to understand. I mean, it's not figurative, it's actually literal and yeah. you really try to understand what it's like to be what they are doing and what they're about and they're, what they go through on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, that's, that's amazing, that's beautiful. Um, uh, so there are a couple of things I wanted to um, you know, end with. Number one, I wanted to get your advice um, for Canadian youth who are watching you and uh, there are people in America who are gonna be watching this as well and uh, some other places as well online. Um, young people who are watching, um, what advice would you give to them uh, when it comes to broadening their horizons beyond their current realities? I mean, you have traveled the world, you have seen the world, this is why you fell in love with a lot of, not only the regions that you've traveled, but photography and telling the stories of people. Um, but there are many people, in fact, majority of us Canadians um, have, of course, maybe don't have either the the luxury to travel or perhaps have just now bothered or they're just in their bubbles and their boxes and in the cocoons and they've never even bothered to come out of that mindset which is you know all that matters is my reality all that matters canada 
all that really matters in the news is our news, maximum maybe news uh, related, to, you know, coming out of the south side of the border. And that's it. I mean, we are we, we are so Canadian and American centric in general, uh, North American centric. Um, what advice do you have for young people to help them broaden their horizons and why should they do that? I'd say uh, to really try to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, it, it can sound scary at first to really get out of your comfort zone because this is the comfort zone is comfortable. But I really believe that that little bit of energy and will that you need to get out of your comfort zone is so worth it for everything that you will gain from getting out of your comfort zone. So you're going to gain a new perspective. You're going to gain a new understanding of certain things. You're going to meet new people. You're going to, and all that together is going to make you love your privilege even more. I mean, be grateful for your privilege, uh, realizing that you have a privilege uh, you're going to have more compassion for other people because you understand their reality. I truly think that hate uh, really comes from not understanding the other person and not wanting to understand. But once you, once you, for example, if you've never met a Muslim before, go out there and try to meet a Muslim. I'm, I'm sure people who actually are Islamophobic, they've never met someone. They, they've never had like a tea with someone that is Muslim. So I find that just getting out of your comfort zone, uh, you can either do this by consuming uh, other types of movies, international movies. You can do this by exploring different food cultures. You, you can do this by, um, if you have the means of traveling and going in a country that is maybe not um, e as easy as France, let's say. You can, yeah, so I'd say just, getting out of your comfort zone and it's not that difficult it's really easy when once you put your mind to it and i think that just creates more compassion and more love and yeah beautiful thank you and what about an advice to a, an emerging you know photographer or visual artist who would like to get who would like to who, you know tell their stories and get noticed um what advice would you have for them uh, especially when it comes to doing some meaningful type of photography and storytelling the way you do? I'd say, it, it's sad to say, but it actually takes time. Um, I think it, it takes some time to, to just explore a ton of different uh, genres, a ton of different subjects, of places you want to take pictures of, of themes you want to shoot, that you want to photo shoot. Um, and I think with time, by building yourself a kind of, a big a body of work, you, you can start taking a step back and noticing um, which themes come back often, which genres. And that's literally how I discovered. And that's if all the online courses I followed, all the big photographers say, you got to photo shoot, photo shoot, photo shoot all the time. And then you'll see that there are some patterns in your work. And that's how I discovered that I love uh, taking pictures of work-related subjects, isolated communities, and fighting Islamophobia. Because over time, I, by following my curiosity and my passion, I discovered that those were the subjects that I was taking pictures of a lot, even if that wasn't my intention at first. So I'd say just take a lot of pictures, try a ton of stuff, and see what really talks to you, what you're passionate about, what you love shooting. Because um, not everything is incredibly fun to take pictures of. So really take your time and explore, explore, explore. And with time, you'll see patterns emerge in your work and subjects that you're more prone to. It can either be homelessness or uh, sex workers or uh, ag uh, farmers or so, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I hope uh, um, young up and coming uh, photographers and storytellers, visual storytellers will find your advice uh, take it to heart and find it useful. Um, you have uh, some uh, work that you have done in Montreal itself. You are from Montreal. Um, and, you know, there are some beautiful images you have taken of the city as well. Um, is there a local project that you are working on or you have some uh, thoughts on that you would love to capture? And also, uh, what's next for Drowster? I mean, is there any other international project you're thinking of um, are there any dream projects you have in mind? 
just share a little bit about what you're up to now and what you plan to do next, both locally and, and internationally. Um, yeah, I'm trying to focus more and more on projects locally. Um, last winter, I took pictures of blind people, uh, how, they're li how they live through the winter, because winter can be hard for everyone, but I can't even imagine how hard it must be for blind people with all the ice and all the snow. So I've been focusing a lot on, on, on blind people. Um, currently, I'm working on a big project about the churches in Montreal, since there's such a, a strong Catholic uh, history to Montreal and it's declining. I think it's important to document what's happening right now before it vanishes completely. And uh, I'm working on a few books at the same time. Uh, books are long uh, processes. It takes a long time to do a book and figure out what you want to do and everything. But um, I'm working on a book about the Middle East, one about churches. I have one coming out in uh, spring that is already ready. So, um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm very flexible. And if ever there's a major event happening worldwide, I'll take a, uh, I'll buy a plane ticket and go check it out and take pictures and try to share stories. So I'm always flexible, but um, and meanwhile, I'm focusing on those projects. Awesome. Wishing you really uh, all the best uh, in your endeavors to capture uh, lives and emotions uh, of people who are marginalized in our communities and marginalized around the world, whether it's the blind and people with disabilities at home in Canada or people whose stories in, in the Middle East are most of the time tainted uh, and distorted uh, with, with the brushes of, you know, uh, terrorism and all forms of hate and Islamophobia and misconceptions, unfortunately. Um, and uh, we, 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 we hope to hear uh, more from you in the near future and see a lot more of your work uh, on social media and elsewhere. And tell us as we conclude, how can people and our audience learn more about your work and how they can connect with you over the next uh, few days. Uh, what would be the best way of connecting with you on social media and elsewhere? The best way would be uh, through my name that you're seeing on the screen right now, Drowster. Uh, on, it's either drowster.com or facebook.com slash Drowster, or Instagram Drowster or Tumblr Drowster. So if you just search that aim, you'll find my work and uh, the specific platforms you're more um, prone to use and I'm, I'm active. And, and tell us uh, as we end actually, uh, tell us the, the story if there is any behind Drowster. I mean, why, what, what does it mean? Why, why is Drowster? It's actually a nickname from high school. Uh, I, for many reasons, uh, some security reasons for going in countries that journalists are not too welcome, like North Korea. Um, it, it's safer for me to use a fake name and not having my journalistic work uh, linked with my real name. Uh, and I find it simple, it's short, it's sweet, it's very Instagram uh, strategy, it's marketing, it's it's actually inspired by Banksy, the street artist that uh, remains anonymous because he'd rather his um, his work to be talked about and the issues he, he paints about to be mentioned. And it's it just, I don't want people to talk about me, I want people to talk about the world and what, what I'm showcasing, so yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Roster, for being here with us and telling us uh, your courageous stories um, and for, uh, for you know, being out there to tell the stories that hardly anybody tells. So wishing you all the best. Thank you once again. Um, thank and you. look forward to having you in the future again on our show. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. And thanks to all our audience today. That's it, folks, for today. You heard from a, a wonderful... Uh, talented, unique uh, photographer who uses, uh, who makes his photography beautiful and meaningful. Um, and that's really the, the philosophy that should be behind all our work that we do um, in, in telling stories uh, to the people around the world. And in fact, any aspect of our lives, making it beautiful and meaningful. Um, and uh, we, you're watching, uh, Taha, you were on Canada today. We look forward to seeing you on the next show. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.